And good afternoon. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and of course on your smart speaker. Coming up today, Keir Starmer has been out and about today. He's got a great plan to win the next election, defending the woke agenda. He said basically, if you enter the culture wars, you're a nasty, evil, desperate Tory. And everything will be calmer under Labour. Of course he'd say that. I'll give you my take on that issue next. Also, the Culture Secretary has said the BBC should not be able to prosecute people for not paying their TV licence. Lucy Fraser then went on to accuse the corporation of being biased. Is there a crisis brewing over there at the Beeb? And over in the States, the Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has dropped out of running to be the next President of the United States. Trump is now charging back to the White House with so much momentum, Sleepy Joe may get confused and pull out of the running himself. We'll have the full details on that a little later. And of course, it's your call. This show is all about your responses and your opinions on the subject of Keir Starmer. We're asking this question, will the woke agenda influence your vote? Our lines are now open, 0344 499 1000. You can text 87222 or tweet at Talk TV. But first, let's get the latest news headlines with Divya. Good afternoon. An extreme weather front is on its way. The newly named Storm Jocelyn is heading for the UK and Ireland tomorrow after Storm Isha battered parts of the country overnight. An 84-year-old man died when the car he was travelling in crashed into a fallen tree in Grangemouth in Scotland. Meanwhile, thousands are still without power as authorities work hard to restore it. Meteorologist and weather presenter Claire Nazir told Talk TV the number of storms the UK has experienced is unusual. And in fact, it's been an exceptional season in terms of storms. Our storm season here in the UK starts in September and goes all the way through the year. Now, last year, we only saw two named storms. Already, though, we're up to a storm name number nine. And in fact, uh, the Met Air, and that's the Irish Met Service, have now named storm number 10, Storm Jocelyn, which will hit the UK tomorrow. Family members of Israeli hostages held by Hamas militants have stormed Parliament in Jerusalem, demanding more is done to free their loved ones. They entered a finance committee meeting and shouted, you won't sit here while they are dying there, while a woman held up pictures of three relatives who were taken. Some 130 hostages remain in Gaza. Sir so Keir Starmer has accused the Tories of waging a war on the proud spirit of service and trying to find woke agendas in British institutions. The Labour leader has given a speech in central London defending charities, including the National Trust and the RNLI, which he says the government is sabotaging. He says if they get into power, they'll build a community fit for the future. In a society of service, doing the right thing should be rewarded. Working hard should pay off for people and building caring, compassionate communities should make our country stronger, more prosperous, fairer for everyone. If you serve others, this country should serve you. Energy bills are expected to fall by 16% this April. Predictions made by consultancy firm Cornwall Insight suggest a typical annual energy bill will drop from just over £1,900 to £1,600. The prediction is not guaranteed, with Ofgem set to announce its price cap change for the second quarter next month. The Duchess of York, Sarah Ferguson, is hoping her skin cancer diagnosis will spur people on to get themselves checked. The 64-year-old said to have found the diagnosis distressing, coming in the same year she had a mastectomy for breast cancer. She's recovering in an, Aust in an Austrian clinic. Royal commentator Kinsey Schofield told us the Duchess is staying strong. We know that this is one of the most aggressive types of skin cancer, which has to be upsetting to her, and that she remains in good spirits, that she, in, in just total Fergie form, continues to be the, rain, the ray of sunshine. I think it says a lot about her, her strength. And an ex-Marine has become the oldest person to reach the South Pole unassisted. Dave Thomas from South Wales has beaten the previous record holder by four years to complete the trek at 68 years old. Alongside his colleague, Alan Chambers, the pair completed the 58 days in some of the planet's most extreme conditions in temperatures as low as minus 24 Celsius. That's the latest weather time now with Nazneen Gap.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, Storm Isha is moving away, but we are still going to see some pretty brisk winds across much of the UK for the rest of today. Also, plenty of showers, as can be seen across uh, many parts of the UK on the earliest satellite and radar picture. So for this afternoon, winds still remain quite strong, particularly around exposed coast gusts up to 60 miles per hour, still likely. No warnings in force, though. And also plenty of showers in between sunny spells, the most heaviest and frequent ones across northern and western parts of the UK, where they could be thundery in nature and wintry across the highlands of Scotland. But mostly rain showers otherwise. And then into tonight, we continue to see showers across parts of the north, mainly over Scotland, Northern England, Northern Ireland. Further south, it becomes drier. And under clear skies, it will be a fairly cool night across eastern areas especially. But out towards the west, we see the next batch of wet weather marching through across much of Ireland and Northern Ireland with strengthening winds and cloudier skies. A less cold night across parts of the west because of that. So tomorrow, it's back to wet and windy conditions again. Not as disruptive as uh, Storm Isha, but it will be a very wet and windy day generally across much of the UK. As you can see, there will be gales and there will be heavy spells of rain that could cause localised flooding, especially across northern areas. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. And good afternoon. Hope you're well. Now, I usually resist using the word woke. It's tricky, you see. I not only agree with most of the so-called anti-woke stories out there, I report on them daily. I shout about them from the rafters. But the word itself has kind of been successfully hijacked by the left. It's been reverse engineered, if you like. It's now kind of up there with phrases like political correctness gone mad, the kind of thing your slightly bonkers uncle might say. Woke has now been redesigned to sound like the sort of word mad old bigots use. It's not true, but that's how a big chunk of the world see it. And there's no more lazy but annoyingly effective way to win an argument than calling your opponent a mad racist. And it's annoying because the contemporary meaning of the word woke is a genuine area of concern and one that we should be discussing on a regular basis. We're living in a world of synthetic outrage and identity politics, a lethal combination, a world where our institutions, from schools to corporations, will happily play to a hysterical gallery of halfwits claiming some kind of invented right or suggesting they're suffering from that well-known clinical problem of being offended. Governments and individual politicians sign up to this claptrap with frightening ease. Today, it was Keir Starmer's turn. He says he wants to end the Tories' war on woke. He's accused them of picking fights to stay in power. He says that the Conservatives are trashing our treasured organisations like the RNLI or the National Trust in order to sow seeds of division. Keir Starmer is an ill-informed man on this one, and if I were to sit here and list the huge variety of incidents from suspicious arrests to industrial-scale evidence of cancel culture... I'd be here all day, and possibly for the rest of the week. So is this just an era we're going through, when a man can get arrested because he might have upset someone because of something he posted on Facebook? Where J.K. Rowling is vilified and compared to Joseph Goebbels for literally saying nothing hateful and finds herself almost removed from the Harry Potter story. In fact, we could almost base this entire conversation just on the lunacy of the J.K. Rowling witch hunt. Jermaine Greer, the Archdeacon of Feminism and traditional left-wing thinking, is cancelled because she's not quite left-wing enough. Where a schoolteacher has his career removed because he refused to use a pupil's preferred gender pronouns without the permission of their parents. Where a child is subjected to what looks like a Sharia court because he scuffed a copy of a religious book in the playground. Where the great works of Shakespeare have to be performed with a trigger warning in case some people get upset with hurty words, where Dr. Seuss books are removed from shelves because they contain some old-fashioned stereotypes, and where a politician is banned from attending a lecture at university because they've committed the horrendous crime of having a different opinion to some of the students. This really is not just an era. This is meant to be the new way of thinking. It's meant to make you kinder, to recognise all the feelings and opinions, no matter how wacky and irrational they might be. The virtuous liberal intelligentsia have decreed that these are the new rules of engagement, from critical race theory, grievance culture, to companies adopting suspicious social responsibility codes. Keir Starmer loves every bit of this. It appeals to his inner core. It appeals to his dubious base of supporters. He's now saying the Tories are out of touch on this. 
This is Labour's ideal dream. They love it, they won't condemn it, and they wear those woke credentials as a badge of honour. So it's either ironic or maybe just a little bit interesting to note that of all the unfathomable areas that have fallen victim to this new way of thinking, the Muppets are also on the list. Just a couple of years ago, Disney added a content warning to Kermit & Co in case folk got offended. At some point this year, the new Muppet show will be in town, headed by Keir Starmer. Consider this your official content warning. With all of this in mind, will the woke agenda influence your vote? Does it matter to you? 0344 499 1000. Our lines are open. Joining me now to chat through the day's big stories, the Telegraph columnist Madeleine Grant is with us. Good to see you, Madeleine. Um, it's an interesting one, this, from Keir Starmer, because we've spent the last year or so saying there's no real difference between Labour and the Tories, and he's trying to mark something out here, clearly. Well, he's deploying a very popular meme on the left, the idea that they have played no part in starting a culture war, that the culture war, such that it is, is a kind of invention of Conservatives, it's happening in our heads. Yeah. And actually, both of these claims are completely nonsensical. You know, it was not the Conservatives, for example, for, for, year, for several years, Keir Starm was very much entertaining the notion that there are numerous different genders, and it took the humiliation of Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland and the failure of the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, which I'm sure at the time people were saying this was a cultural war issue, even mm. though it was actually very, very important. It had real-world implications Correct. for women in prison and uh, children at school who were being encouraged down a potentially um, unalterable journey of transition. Um, but this was again dismissed as being frivolous. And it was yeah. only when it, it turned out that the public overwhelmingly agreed actually with the Conservatives on this one and it forced a change of policy that now that Labour has suddenly figured out what a woman is. So actually, the idea that this it stuff... It took a while. It, it took a while, but also I really despise the notion that because anything that falls under the banner of not being the economy, for example, yep. or not being foreign policy is frivolous and stupid. But it's, it's not. It's about material reality. It's about, yeah. it's about truth. Yeah. And actually, a lot of what um, Keir Starmer talked about in his speech is explicitly a straw man. I mean, I might be wrong, but I, I think, from my understanding, what's happening with the National Trust is members of the National Trust who are unhappy with the direction it's gone in could be partly to do with kind of woke things, but actually more often than not, it's to do with the dumbing down of things at the National Trust. It's to do with um, stultifying the exhibits, having um, actual factual errors in some of what they're putting out. If you go to a National Trust yeah. house, often it's riddled with mistakes. Um, so I think it's it's not only um, it's not only wrong, but it's it's very disingenuous because it actually misrepresents what that debate was all about. Yeah, and interestingly, on the on the National Front one, I mean, there was always the uh, what appears to be the ongoing link with slavery. You know, this, this house was built yeah. on the funds of slavery. Now, I, I get that. There's nothing wrong with educating somebody where the wealth of the previous yes. homeowner came from. Uh, however, I mean, do, do you then have to put another thing up? So it was also built by slave labour. It was built by, you know, children went up chimneys during mm. this same time. Yeah. It was uh, women at that time were raped and beaten if they did anything to upset the, the, the higher echelons of society or any other man for that matter. Nobody had the... I mean, yeah. where do you go with well, that? Well, it, it may well... I mean, actually, plenty of National Trust houses have you know, have done this in a, a very educational, sensible way in which perhaps it's not the only thing being discussed because it may have only, you know, it may have partially paid for the house but not exclusively, something like this. But sometimes it goes into rampant overkill. Um, there was a case where I think there was an exhibit at Jane Austen's house where they had it all... They made so much of it to do with slavery, even though Jane Austen was a, a massive ab abolitionist. It's very clear from reading books like Emma and Mansfield Park that mm -hmm. she was against the slave trade. And her family, she, she was not a wealthy woman and her money mostly came from gifts from relatives and from occasionally from the sales of her books and from her father who was a vicar. Yes. You know, so this was not... They're not like she a didn't slaving, make all that money at the time. That's the point, family. Right, But indeed. sometimes, I think especially after yep. 2020, with, you know, the fallout from the murder of George Floyd, I think some of these exhibitions went a bit too far in that direction, to the point of it actually not being instructive anymore. Correct, yeah. And there was, there's also this thing about cancel culture. I mean, there's a, a point where sort of... And it is predominantly, almost exclusively, actually, left-wing left, left -wing thinking. So, no, tell me somebody who's been cancelled. Give me an example of somebody who's been cancelled. And it's sounding like the Monty Python, you know, what did the Romans ever do for us thing? Yeah. Because 
the list of cancel culture is absolutely vast. You open your newspaper any single day. The most obvious and most famous example of that is J.K. Rowling, as I mentioned. I mean, which yeah. is just the most... If somebody had told you this five years ago, that she'd become a hate figure for millions of people and receive the kind of bilious and horrendous yeah. attacks that she gets, nobody could have believed you. And also for stating a position which is actually the mainstream. So that's, again, yeah. the problem with Labour's thesis, is that much of what they are calling super divisive and a waste of everyone's time is actually what probably more people think than not. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure. I mean, certainly, as you pointed out in your intro, um, many sort of left-wing thinkers have done quite a good job of portraying woke as this kind of, like, imaginary thing. Yep. But when you start to ask the question of what's woke, I mean, for example, is woke, let's say, the, the, um, the conflict between radical Islam and free speech? Is that woke? Is, yeah. you know, is it woke to care about free speech? I mean, th these are very fundamental issues. Absolutely, that's a great Maybe point. the word is unhelpful because it, mean, it could literally mean anything that you, you care to use it for at any yeah. time. Good point. Um, let's get on to the BBC. They're, uh, they're never out the headlines at the moment. A um, couple of stories around this. Uh, Lucy Fraser, who's the culture secretary, has had a couple of absolute horrific interviews this morning where she was um, essentially challenged on whether the BBC are biased and not unreasonably. The interviewers on two different channels, she was also on Talk TV as well, um, pursued the point, well, you know, give us some evidence of this. And she was on fairly wobbly ground, probably because it's a classic case of somebody being elevated to a cabinet position without really knowing much about the, the territory they're being asked to preside over. Um, so there was that, but there was also the issue um, about the BBC's uh, prosecuting people for not paying the licence fee. Now, on the bias thing, can the BBC ever win that argument? It's difficult. Um, it certainly feels like, in the last few years, the complaints have grown. Um, it does feel like a quite a different BBC from what I can remember growing up. Um, I think it's partly been, actually, due to the influence of sometimes other TV channels where personality looms larger. Mm. BB, the BBC have, have started to, to, to put personality front and centre, yeah. which has meant that the presenter's opinion is more... And this is actually true of a lot of TV nowadays. It's, true, it's also true of Sky, for example. When I was growing up, I remember watching BBC channels and I sort of couldn't have told you what anyone thought personally and it's become a bit clearer now. Um, but it's very difficult because they get it from the left and they get it from the right for yeah, different yeah. reasons. That's true. Um, I, I do think that they, there are efforts... They do try hard. The problem is sometimes that um, there's a, a problem of a lack of diversity of opinion within the BBC. So they may, even though they're trying not to be biased, they may in fact have a sort of bias of what stories they select and what things are commissioned. So it's I not even, they're yeah. not even aware of it. But there are also, I mean, it has to be said, there are quite a lot of you know, conservative or right-wingers in very high positions at the BBC as yeah. well, whether it's in the Board of Governors, whether it's in broadcasting itself. Yes. Um, and, of course, there are... You know, I've worked at the BBC and I remember it being very, very frustrating for lots of reasons. It wasn't really this. And I, I, I yeah. also remember, you know, a, a very, very left-wing producer who was the dictionary definition of impartial... Yes. ..who would be insistent that you got Nigel Farage on because he's the right person to debate this issue. Yes. And she was a, a Corbyn diehard, this woman. But yeah. she left her politics at the door. Maybe there's not enough of that going on. I think that's... That's probably true. Um, certainly, I, 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 can, I, I feel that the BBC, if it, if it could fulfil that, if, if it could fulfil that ambition, that would yep. be a brilliant thing, because I think we do actually need um, some element of that when everything is becoming more factional, more partisan. Indeed. Um, final story here, Madeline, and this kind of ties in really with our first story, Stonewall. Uh, once upon a time, a uh, very proud and incredibly effective gay rights organisation, game-changing in that respect, I think yes. globally recognised and pats on the back all round for what they did. But they've kind of... As the, if you like, the, the gay equality argument has kind of run its ground in many respects, not fully over, but more yeah. or less, um, <clears throat> they sort of moved into more transgender issues. More than 300 schools have been told to stop calling pupils boys and girls after signing up to a scheme run by the transgender rights lobbying group Stonewall. I mean, we said at the beginning, you know, are we losing our mind over some of this? I, I said I resist the word woke, yeah. I'm sure you know why, but... I mean, what, what do you call this? This is an insanity. Don't call boys and girls boys and girls. These people are ill. There's something wrong with them. I just want to know how, how this has happened after, actually, the government has says that it has cut all ties with Stonewall... Um, over the last few years. So I wonder what is going on at the schools. 
I'm not sure if these are private schools or, or state schools, but I w wonder what is happening that they are deliberately making ties with an organisation, even after everything that we know about... Because I, I think they think it makes them a night. Oh, it's Stonewall. Yes, we must sign up to them. If they say yeah. something, then it's bound to be nice and friendly. Why would we not? We've got primary schools, secondary schools, nurseries, teaching kids as young as two. Yeah. Uh, as two, receive awards from the charity Stonewall if they remove any unnecessary gendered language from the classroom. It's... it's I mean, it's boys I mean... and girls, right? I mean... <laughs> Well, since when did that become controversial? Uh, it's extraordinary. I mean, that, am I imagining this? I mean, is this? Am I imagining this whole existence I'm in, Madeline? Are you really here? Am I actually here on talk TV? Because the world seems to have gone upside down. It's Alice in Wonderland territory. I just, I'm, I really, I, it's extraordinary to me that this is not. I don't, actually, I guess we shouldn't be that surprised if we're not paying attention True. to what's what is happening at schools and a lot of the the Overton window on this sort of thing shifted very quickly dramatically even five six years ago yeah. people spoke about very differently about transgender it was considered more of a um, it wasn't considered a sort of identity that you were born yeah. with in the same way that it that it that it is now and also the idea of of, of people who are not transgender being like cis this is all very, yes. a very recent development yeah, it's incredible cis. how how quickly it's sort it's of all that um, about. you've got it's, a label it's, it's sort well, you of, didn't need a label. It's it's re it's come to really uh, it's it's infested all sorts of areas of public life and yep. institutions, and you know the civil service. Everyone uses you know this using your email signature gender pronouns. <laughs> it's pretty, but I think schools really shouldn't be engaging in this Correct. what is highly divisive and contested stuff. Correct. It's boys and girls. Um, Madeline, on that point, thank you. Good thank to you. see you, Madeline Grant, Telegraph columnist. With us here on the program coming up, we'll continue. Sakir Starmer and the Labour Party demonstrate why they will go into the general election as the party of woke, as he accuses the Tories of stoking a culture war in a desperate attempt to cling to power. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr. Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, no. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Steve <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, and persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won. is very telling. 
Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and of course on your smart speaker. Back to our main story. Sir Keir Starmer has dipped his toes into the culture wars. The Labour leader has attacked the government for waging war on organisations such as the RNLI and the National Trust and the Trussell Trust. In its desperation to cling on to power at all costs, the Tory party is undertaking a kind of weird McCarthyism trying to find woke agendas in the very civic institutions they once regarded with respect. Let me tell you, waging a war on the proud spirit of service in this country isn't leadership. It's desperate. It's divisive. It's damaging. And it comes well, to... The speech set out plans to work with the sector if Labour wins power. He said civil society will be essential to the party's plans for government. This comes as the, our government promised a crackdown on civil servants who waste taxpayers' money as a vehicle to promote their political agenda. To discuss this, I'm joined by former Labour advisor Richard Power Saeed and Harry Phibbs from Conservative Home. Afternoon to you both. Um, what's, the, uh, what's the MO on this then, Richard, are you sensing? Why did Keir Starmer dip his toes in this particular debate? Well, hey there, Ian. Nice to see you, as always. Um, I, you know, I've got a lot of respect for you, Ian, but I think you've been a little bit unfair uh, in your intro there uh, to, to Keir. Uh, the idea that this is him getting involved in the culture war, this is Labour being woke, I think people will have heard the quote from him there and they'll realise that that's not really what's happened today, is it? It's Keir Starmer saying the Tories are trying to distract us from the real issues by talking about, like, what colour lanyard somebody at the National Trust has, you know? It's nonsense, right? There are 2.6 million kids in this country who go hungry very frequently. 13 million households this year. 13 million. I actually didn't know that until I Googled it earlier. 13 million who haven't turned the heating on at times this winter and have gone cold as a result because they can't afford it. That's what people should be talking about. It's what real people are talking about. It's what Keir Starmer is talking about. But unfortunately, it's not what Rishi Sunak and but, the yeah. kind of like weirdos in particular right wing rags want okay. to talk about. I mean, of course, they want to distract us from the real issues. All right, Rich. It was great spin doctoring on your part, Richard. I have to say that was a, that was a masterclass, frankly. Uh, let me put, let me put some of this to you, Harry. Um, I, I mean, the point Madeleine Grant made it earlier on the programme. I mean, there are lots of issues to discuss. The economy is obviously crucial. The cost of living, as Richard was saying, absolutely crucial. There are other issues that people care about as well, and this seems to be one of them. Yes, I think, I mean, there's a link, obviously, that that if, if the public sector is using taxpayers' money to employ uh, diversity officers and if quangos are, are indulging in all, all this stuff, then that, of course, does increase our tax and increase our... Um, cost of living. But I think the I think the fundamental point is the dishonesty of, of Keir Starmer in suggesting that this is something that's a, a cultural war that the, the Conservatives have invented. Um, I mean, what in terms of the National Trust, for example, uh, them supporting organisations and agendas of, of groups like Stonewall and, and Black Lives Matter, um, that's, that's the reality. Now, Keir Starmer um, supported Black Lives Matter. He famously um, uh, uh, took, took the knee with Angela Rayner. He supported Stonewall's agenda, saying that um, a woman can have a penis. And so that, in a way, that, that, that's, that's if he wants to actually take those controversial positions, I mean, I think are appalling, extreme and, and divisive, you know, then, 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 then let him state that case. But, but don't pretend that, that, that these are inventions on behalf of the, on, on the part of the Conservatives, and particularly sort of gaslighting us when he talked about McCarthyism. The, the, the McCarthyism, the attack on free speech, is is from the woke forces, and that's something that that has that, that has happened in, in in reality in many organisations, and is is something that is is appalling. I don't think we should be um, you know making light of it. We shouldn't be laughing at it. Some of these issues, in terms of the the, the transgenderism, in, encouraging um, uh, teenagers to have their bodies. Um, 
mutilated, um, people losing their jobs because of because of uh, uh, speaking, giving their giving their views. I mean, these are actually serious issues, and and Keir Starmer's on 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 the wrong side of it, and he's being dishonest about his allegiances. I mean, that's the point, isn't it, Richard? That uh, I mean, everything that Harry said these these are not imagined things. There are a lot of confusing things going on in this world right now. Whether it's about gender, whether it's about diversity, or an overt focus on areas such as that, or, or some of the other things that were mentioned there. The sense now will be that Keir Starmer is on the side of all that claptrap and the Conservatives are batting for the other side. There's a divide here now. Well, Harry said that people really care about this. The great thing is that there's actually facts and figures and numbers that we can go to to find out how much people care about it. We can go to YouGov, who are extremely impartial, definitely not a left-wing organisation, um, and we can see from YouGov what people are telling them over the years they care about, what they're going to be voting on. And I'll tell you what, in the last five years, that's the data I looked at earlier today, nobody, the, the, the proportion of people who've said that this is what matters to them, I mean, it's so small, it doesn't even come up on the graph, right? And there's, there's, there's about 20 different topics um, that, they, uh, that, that, that do come up much higher than it. The problem is for the government, the problem is for anybody who wants to talk about this sort of stuff, that you've got an NHS in crisis, um, you've got uh, fuel costs going through, you've got supermarkets profiteering from people's desperation. And quite frankly, no, people do not care about all of this nonsense. They want our country to be brought together by but a leader. Is it, is it nonsense though, said, Richard, when, when, you have, when, when you have schools and primary schools and even nurseries, uh, being told to, in order to win a certificate, not not to or to encourage the the words boys and girls to be removed from the classroom. I mean, that's not an imagined, mad, right wing, invented story. That's actually happening. When J.K. Rowling is chased uh, out the village that, with that, the burning torches, that's not invented. This is very real. So, Ian, I think you've just kind of just answered your own question there. It's for a certificate. These schools have gone to Stonewall and they've said, we want to stop uh, imposing particular gender ideas about this is what boys are like, this is what girls are like to, on the kids that we're looking after. Because you know what? Loads of children really don't like that. Loads of adults really don't like it. They think that men and women can be whoever they want to be. They don't want to be labelled like that. And so guess what? You're going to no, take not that kind of gender... No, I'm going to finish, girl, I'm gonna finish that's, Ian. That's Ian, Ian I'm, I'm, I am directly responding to your question, sure. so I feel like I should be allowed to finish. So lots of schools have made that very reasonable decision that loads of adults would really, really uh, approve of, and they'd say that their own childhoods would have been much happier if there hadn't been the expectations of, like, boys do blue and girls do pink or whatever nonsense. And so the schools have decided that's what they want to do. The parents have every right to take their kids out of that school if they don't want them to be there. The schools have gone to Stonewall and said, can you give us some tips on how to do it? And Stonewall have said, when you don't need to say boys and girls, don't say boys and girls, say kids. It's as simple as that. And, you're, and, and people are turning that into some political issue. That is what it's like when you're trying okay. to distract people from kids going hungry, households not heating themselves, supermarkets profiteering on your food bills. So, That's some, just all right, no, I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, Richard, and it's a very honest appraisal from you, and I would imagine Keir Starmer is, if the truth be known, probably in exactly that place. But, Harry, what Richard has just outlined there, and full house points for honesty, is precisely for some other people the problem. I know. I think. I think Richard, being far more honest than Keir Starmer in terms of, uh, in terms of um, nailing his, his woke um, credentials to the to the mask. But when he talked about wanting to unite people and not wanting to divide people, what I think is so pernicious about about some of this woke stuff is how divisive it, it is. Is trying to have um, interest group um, politics and particularly in in schools and 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 it's it, 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 it's it's not some. Uh, I mean, I wish I wish it was something that was just affecting, uh, you know, a tiny, a tiny number of schools or, 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 or a sort of tiny number of people. It is um, quite widespread in universities and in schools. We've seen, I mean, for example, the um, issue of, of Michaela, which by trying to be um, inclusive has has had tremendous success. I mean, Catherine Burble seems had I mean, it's absolutely top performing school by by trying to say, right, let's 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 all be 
patriotic, let's all be united, and let's let's put aside all these divisions. And she's now coming under 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 pressure, saying that there should be uh, a, a more segregated approach. So I think that the I think it's the woke forces that are that are that are divisive, and I think that it's it's dangerous, and that it's quite right uh, for for conservatives to be. Um, challenging it and i think we should be honest uh, about the importance of it and and the threat to freedom of speech and the threat to our integrated british society richard do you think jk rowling is a horrendous character a hate figure justifiably so i i, I, I honestly don't know anything about jk rowling i thought her books were really boring oh, come on you, you know a bit they were yeah, you're, on, you're on the bus my, there though my, aren't you the books were boring don't and, really and, she like that. and she talks about like look, look She's decided she wants to talk about how she opposes trans rights. Some people have criticised her. Some people have been really unpleasant towards her on Twitter, completely unacceptable. But, like, you know, people... When I go on Talk TV, I get people tweeting at me saying really unpleasant things, yeah. right? Do you know why that is? It's because I'm going on Talk TV and I'm expressing my views. And when anybody goes out there in public and talks about their views and, and talks about things which are a bit controversial then they're going to have really unpleasant people on Twitter saying really unpleasant things to them. There happens to everyone. Yeah. And you make a decision about whether you want to go out there and be part of the public debate or not. Okay. And JK Rowling is a tough person. And she said, I'm going to go out there and be involved in this debate. Yeah. The, like, it happens to everybody. It's not just happening to, to, to one person. It's really but unpleasant. No, I, I, listen, I, 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 I get that. I think some people would counter that and say but she wasn't actually saying anything controversial, which is why it becomes a, a, a talking point, maybe. Listen, Richard, Harry, we stop there for time. No other reason. Thank you, guys. Richard Power Said, former Labour advisor. Harry Phibbs with us from Conservative Home. You've been calling in on this. Let's get a call in on this. John is in Berkshire. What are you thinking, John? Good afternoon to you. Oh, hello there. Yeah, I'd love just to say, look, I think the problem is with Keir Starmer, he's pretty much the same as, as uh, Rishi Sunak because, you know, they both have the same policies. They both believe in mass migration, you know, depressing sort of British workers' um, salaries. Um, they both believe in sort of allowing illegal immigration into this country. You know, you've got the situation where, you know, the, the Tories, um, after 12 months, they allow illegal immigrants to actually work legally. And Labour wanted that to be cut down to six months. Um, you know, they, they, they both believe that the House of Lords shouldn't, shouldn't be, you know, um, adjusted or sort of reformed. Um, they believe in foreign aid, sending billions of pounds to, you know, India okay. and China, for example. I mean, what, what, what is the difference? Well, this is Keir Starmer's moment of difference, maybe, that well, we won't, we won't in, indulge in the culture wars, let the Tories do that, and they're only doing it to try and hang on to power. I mean, if, if, if you were to... If you were to Talk to anyone to go out, to go out on the street. I don't know in somewhere like Bury or you know Doncaster and say, "What does Sir Keir Starmer stand for?" People, people would be like, "Well, we don't know." Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's, he's massively ahead in the polls. It's it's an absolute mystery. But that, I mean, he's not the only politician, and they're not the only party to be the recipient of that but, sort of vague mystery. When people say, well, "I'm going to vote for them because they might be better than the but, the but people he, in he, power," I don't know what they stand for, but they've got to be better. That seems to be his he, greatest he, he, uh, quality really, at the moment. That he's not Rishi Sunak. He's only good in the polls, like, like you said, because of Rishi Sunak, because, yeah. you know, Rishi Sunak's terrible, and Rishi and Sakir Starmer's, like, pretty, pretty terrible, but not as, not as terrible as the Conservatives. Indeed. <laughs> um, oh, no, no, I, I get it. Listen, and I, I wonder whether this is uh, Starmer's way of trying to draw a bit of a line on, on the issue of culture wars. I, I think I mean, it's a very important issue. I, don't, I think it's just been very easily oh. written off as well, it's just a little arrest, bit of side dish issue. I think when people start policing our language, people start yeah. losing their jobs for oh, very oh, 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 uncontroversial opinions, I think we are in serious territory. Listen, John, oh. I step in for no other reason than time. Thank you for that. Great call from John in Berkshire. This is Talk TV. Next, the government has promised to crack down on the BBC trying to prosecute people who don't pay the licence fee. It follows a Talk TV investigation which found that nearly 130 people are being taken to court every single day. The Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser, said the Beeb shouldn't have those types of criminal tools at their disposal. OK, we haven't got that little bit of video for you, no? 
it happens. Uh, it comes as the BBC is facing tougher scrutiny amid claims of bias at the corporation. Ofcom will now police its websites and social media channels to ensure impartiality. With me, Talk TV's political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, is with us. Alicia, I mean, it's the BBC again. They're back in the spotlight. They never, never a few days go past without the Beeb finding themselves in the firing line. Um, We've had Lucy Fraser out today uh, suggesting she thinks there is some bias at the BBC. She struggled a little bit to give specific evidence. I think she was talking more about perception. Definitely. So her point was very much that Ofcom should be policing not just the TV output on the BBC, not just the traditional outputters, but also their app the stuff that gets written on the digital parts of their website that actually is where a lot of people get their news these days. And that is the part that the government is saying is just not highly scrutinised enough. They're saying the TV, the presenters, good old Gary Lineker, and all of that gets really, really heavily scrutinised and watched. But everything that's written in the more digital side of the BBC kind of slips below the parapet yeah, yeah. and people don't pick up on it as much. I wonder whether... I mean, we, let's have a little listen. We can listen now to that, what Lucy Fraser had to say on this issue. Here it is. I have said uh, that I don't agree with criminal prosecutions uh, in relation to the BBC. Our powers are limited in order to change that. Uh, as I mentioned, we can only make fundamental change at charter review periods. But I have said at the next charter uh, review period, um, I will look at those criminal prosecutions. It is... Uh, I mean, that's 2027, isn't it? I've got a funny feeling that Lucy Fraser might not be on the scene at that point. It's just a bit of a guess, Alicia. Couldn't I mean, possibly I, comment. Absolutely. <laughs> who knows? Um, but nonetheless, on that point of prosecuting people who haven't paid their licence, I mean, it's a... I mean, the people will argue forever the bias thing. We saw it with Brexit. You had half the people thinking they were pro-Remain and half mm. the Alistair Campbells of this world saying, no, this is like the British Brexit organisation. Uh, and some would say, well, if they were getting equal jip and hassle from both sides, that means they've probably done something right. Uh, putting all of that aside, it's increasingly difficult to... I, I tell you what I did on Saturday. This is relevant to Go us. On. And I'm sure you did as well. I watched Gladiators. I didn't, but... You didn't watch it? What's wrong with you, Fitzgerald? What's <laughs> wrong with you? Too busy watching talk TV. Of course, of course. So I watched Gladiators. It's the new series. Um, but it's on the BBC. My little boy was watching it. And I walked into the room. I thought, oh, Gladiator's on. I was sitting there watching it, thinking, where's the commercial break? There's been no commercial break. I read, it was on the BBC. The BBC. It used to be on ITV uh, many moons ago. And I thought, is this the sort of programme the BBC are meant to be making? I mean, the Strictly Come Dancing thing, I get it, because it was a format when first proposed, oh, we're going to make a programme about ballroom dancing. Any commercial outlet would have gone, clear off. You're not coming near here. That's never going to work. <laughs> but they managed to pimp it into a contemporary format and it's done well. But Gladiators is so overtly a commercial endeavour that I was slightly staggered to see it there. And even if I could understand why it's there, it's increasingly difficult, almost impossible, to intelligently construct an argument set against Amazon and Apple and Netflix and oodles of others as to why the BBC should remain in the current funding system that it is. Well, it's this, really uh, hard. It just opens that big kind of age-old age debate yeah. about whether or not the licence fee is a fair way of accruing money to fund the TV channel. Lots of people will argue yes, we have to remember that. Lots of people see it as kind of a national treasure of the UK. But there are lots of people increasingly who just feel like it is very, very expensive. And lots of people who don't watch the BBC whatsoever, who yeah. just feel it's totally unfair that they should be paying for something that they don't really engage with. And the point that Lucy Fraser was making just then about people being prosecuted, that is something that the government really have to deal with because it's often elderly people, for example, it's often people who are more vulnerable, who don't have a lot of money, mm. who are getting these letters through their doors and then potentially escalated to court claims Correct. because they haven't paid their yeah, licence yeah. fee. And lots of people look at that and say, hang on, our streets across the country are quite bad in terms of crime at the moment. Yep. Not a lot of prosecutions in terms of the amount of crime that's actually happening. Is this really the most important thing that the judges and courts should be spending their time on? And I think that's it, isn't it? I mean, the likelihood is, assuming all the polls are correct and everything aligns, then Keir Starmer will be in power. A Labour government are less likely to tinker with the licence fee as a notion. Probably. I think this will be one of those things that Keir Starmer probably leaves in the, the Tory basket of stuff that he will call woke and say it's just nonsense that shouldn't really be yeah. the biggest focus at the moment. Keir Starmer, especially with those comments that he made today uh, about the National Trust, the RNLI, we, we heard earlier, 
I think Keir Starmer will put this definitely into the same bracket as that and say this is just not the thing we should be focusing on at the moment. And also, back to the impartiality thing, it seems to sway every few years. People seem to have different views on where the BBC is swinging. At the moment, people think it has a very liberal um, bias. But in the 2019 general election, people thought it had a massive conservative bias. So yeah. it's one of those things that seems to, seems to sway. Indeed. Uh, de devastating. You never saw gladiators. <laughs> I was going to ask you about Viper's oh, outburst no. against Bradley Walsh when he broke the microphone. He really got the hump. Viper did. Great gladiator. Ninja qualities, Alicia. Very, very good. But I he really was don't very, know what to ask he was that. very, very unhappy. And then they did the little thing on the. Oh, it was amazing. You missed it all. I You've got to keep up with this stuff. Well, I'll have to watch it later then, won't I? Do you think Keir Starmer was watching it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> too, too woke for Keir, maybe. Who knows? Alicia, thank you. Uh, coming up after the break, uh, as Ron DeSantis drops out of the 2025 presidential race, Donald Trump is suddenly full of praise for his former Republican rival. We'll have more on that next. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, no. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Steve <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, and persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Uh, welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and, of course, on your smart speaker. Now, across the pond, Donald Trump has described his Republican rival, Ron DeSantis, as a really terrific person after the Florida governor dropped out of the 2024 presidential race and endorsed the former president. DeSantis announced on Sunday he will be ending his campaign trail ahead of the New Hampshire primary, where he was polling at just 6%. Despite a long-running and bitter rivalry between the two candidates, Trump was full of praise for Ron DeSantis while speaking at a rally just yesterday. Well, he left the campaign trail today at 3 p.m. and 
In so doing, he was very gracious, and he endorsed me, so I appreciate it. I appreciate that, and I also look forward to working with Ron and everybody else to defeat crooked Joe Biden. We will have to get him out. DeSantis' exit means Nikki Haley is now the only candidate competing against Trump for the 2024 Republican nomination. Joining me now, U.S. political commentator, managing editor at Inside Sources, our friend Michael Graham is back with us. Um, I can't help Michael but want to just laugh. I mean, every time he speaks, <laughs> uh, I mean, the crooked Joe comment is always amusing, um, but he's now got a new best friend in Ron DeSantis. Who would have thought it? Well, hey, Trump loves people who love Donald Trump, and that's his whole system. And by the way, I assume you can tell that I'm not sitting in our usual studio. I'm actually on the streets of Manchester, New Hampshire, right down the street from the Doubletree Hotel, where all the action will be happening later, and um, talking to, uh, to voters and, of course, covering it through our New Hampshire Journal uh, product. And I will tell you that the thing that unites the Republican Party is that, rightly or wrongly, Republicans like Donald Trump. They just do. And so if Trump says you're supposed to hate Ron to Sanctimonious, then they're going to hate him. And then it's time to give him a big hug. They're ready to do that as well. Although I did run into a guy today in downtown Manchester who had a Ron DeSantis 2024 hat. And he had taken a little piece of tape and put like a, oh, an eight over it. So he's already ready for 2028. <laughs> I like his thinking. It's worth, uh, Michael, while you're with us, let's just remind everybody of uh, how relatively recently this is how Donald Trump used to talk about Big Ron. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you about, from Ron's standpoint, he's definitely not up to the job. I haven't even mentioned the name of Ron DeSanctimonious yet because I think he's gone. Uh, he, he does not wear high heels, okay? He does not wear high heels. All right, maybe. And I'm not wearing lifts either, by the way. I don't have six-inch heels. The problem with Ron DeSanctimonious is that he needs a personality transplant. And Ron DeSanctimonious and Nikki Haley and all the rest of the pack will never do what it takes to secure the border. They'll never do what it takes to make our country great again. And one of the... <laughs> I'm going to just watch that over and over again for the next three exactly. hours. Well, and, and, of course, the one thing we tend to forget, Michael, is that these guys are all from the same party, for goodness sake. Look, everybody... Someone was asking, I can't believe that Ron DeSantis is going to endorse Donald Trump. Look, Ron DeSantis was always going to endorse Donald Trump if Donald Trump became the nominee. Yep. Nikki Haley, if Trump, if as expected, Donald Trump gets about 50 percent in New Hampshire tomorrow night, she's at some point, whether it's before South Carolina's primary at the end of February or after, she's going to endorse him. That's what you do. It's you, you know, you, this is the interfight party, and then that ends, and you all put on your jerseys and you go out and play for Team Red or Team Blue. Remember, just four years ago, Joe Biden came to New Hampshire and came in fifth place. Fifth place yeah. behind Bernie, kooky Bernie Sanders and, uh, you know, uh, Pete Buttigieg. And yet what happened uh, a month later when he became the nominee, everybody was on board. So, you know, I'm sitting here at the Bridge Cafe in downtown Manchester. People are talking politics and nobody is surprised that Republicans are uniting around their candidate any more than they are the Democrats are gathering around there. Indeed. Nikki Haley, of course, will be the next to endorse Donald Trump inevitably at some point. Um, although not before more than a few side swipes. Uh, in fact, she's kind of playing the <laughs> cognitive game, I notice, something that Trump yes. does very well with Sleepy Joe. She's accusing the former president of losing his mind, essentially. Well, she's saying, you know, you have cognitive issues with Joe Biden and now you've had some stumbles with uh, Donald Trump. He uh, said Nikki Haley at an event the other night that I was at where he really meant to former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. But th those, the fact is, like last night, Trump did a two-hour rally, two hours of talk. And obviously some of it's scripted, but most of it's not. Joe Biden, could Joe Biden do a two-minute unscripted TV? <laughs> I don't know. So yeah. I don't think that that argument is going to work. The argument that she's been using that has got some attention is that he's a chaos agent, that you know people are tired of disorder in America. There's a lot of concern about the border and crime and international issues. And do you want more chaos? And then the other argument that seems to be working with New Hampshire Journal uh, readers uh, when we surveyed them really was, uh, can he win in November? Or can he beat Joe Biden? Yeah. And can he beat Joe Biden? There is the question, Michael. Ian, you could beat Joe Biden. 
I, well, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I mean, I would take that that guy on any day of the week. I just no, no, no <laughs> doubt about that. And I mean, the Donald Trump super fan base never stops. I mean, Donald Trump could sleep with your daughter and then kill your dog, and people would still mm -hmm. say, "But he's a good guy." Well, if you reverse those, you might get into some trouble. But I don't know. I just look. He's got his strong support. The question is, can he build a bigger coalition? Can yeah. he get uh, some of the suburban college-educated voters who've abandoned him in the past? back on board. I don't know that he can get them to vote for him, but I definitely think Joe Biden can get them to not vote for Joe Biden. I think that's the, yeah. the, the game. Well, I, we've got an election as well this year, Michael, and yours is far more exciting, frankly, <laughs> um, although ours might be a little more concerning. I would say that much. Michael Graham, as ever, thank you. Uh, joining thank us you. Uh, ready over there in New Hampshire uh, for that primary. Thank you to him. Uh, more comment coming in from you. We asked the question, simple question at the very beginning, will the woke agenda influence your vote? Uh, reason being, Keir Starmer has kind of waded into that, saying the Tories are obsessed with culture wars. Uh, I think it's reasonable, the point that Madeleine Grant raised at the beginning of the programme, that it's not just the economy, it's not just cost of living. There are other issues people care about. I happen to think that culture wars, if that is the way to define it, Policing our language, I think, is curious. Uh, somebody losing their job because of a misgendering, I think, is, uh, frankly, criminal. And there's a lot of that going on out there. Jackie says, Starmer is the one stoking the woke agenda with Labour's identity politics. Labour will be a disaster for social cohesion, says Jackie. Alexander says, the woke agenda does, in fact, uh, affect my vote. It makes me vote against it. Do the Tories cut it, though? Josh says... Uh, Joe, rather, says, anyone who doesn't know what a woman is hasn't got the capacity to run the country. One in from Kieran on the same subject. Yes, the woke nonsense makes me want to vote, vote against Labour, despite being centre-left. And I think that's a really good point, because those, particularly on gender issues, when it comes to that, this is really not something that is you're either Tory or you're Labour. I know plenty of you know, left-wingers uh, that are not that enamoured with, uh, with the woke agenda when it comes to Keir's position. Sadly, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join me the same time tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Up next on Talk TV, it's Vanessa Feltz. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, no. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Steve Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden.